Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Tim. Well, I'm, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I see faces I recognize, and there are people that I don't know yet that I'd like to meet. I'd like to talk to as many people as possible. Um, I learned, this is my education. I'm here, I'm learning from you, from everybody, from families, individuals, and I would say that other investigators here are learning. Yes, they're talking, we're talking, but they're actually absorbing ideas from the people that are here, and this is so, it's, it's immeasurably important. So, today and yesterday, we've had discussions about um, molecular processes, gene therapies, biochemistry, cell biology, and these are the you know, fundamental processes in PLS and HSP. I'm not going to talk about that. We study that too. We have projects involving mice and, and um, biomarkers and things like that. I'm not going to address that. I'm going to go in a different direction, and I'm going to talk about, about living with PLS and HSP, and what are we going to do today? Now, we're, of course, we're working to achieve the future. That's what we're doing. We're trying to make, bring the future one step closer, the future where we have corrective therapies that address the underlying process. Yes, we're working towards that. I'm not, I'm, I'm, that's extremely important. There, but we need to work on managing the symptoms, day-to-day -day management. Now, that's what I'm gonna talk about today. It has a kind of a strange title, Let's Dance. And uh, so I'm the last person you would imagine to talk about uh, dance. And uh, I'm surprised myself that I'm talking about dance. But I think it's, it's actually out of a sense of responsibility that we talk about this. The formal uh, concept is emerging strategies um, towards neural rehabilitation. Let's see if I can figure this out. I've got my email here, and that's so you can contact me. And I will answer your email. I, my email is already blown up, and so it may be delayed. If I don't answer you, then write me again, and please don't be offended. So. This is a personal mantra, but we're never going to be a leader if we just follow somebody else. We need, to, we need to shape the future, our own individual futures, and collectively the futures of, of uh, not just the organizational future, but the future of treating this condition. To, to, to stay ahead of the curve, we need to be the curve. We need to define the leading edge. And this is a personal responsibility that each of us has, that I have. We need to in, imagine where we're going and then go there and be that leader. That's a personal sense of responsibility. Okay, now anybody who knows me, and most people here know me, they say, whoa, Dr. Fink talks about exercise. And I do. And it's not so much a matter of well, it's a fine line between teaching and preaching. And, I, and I'm, sometimes I'm not sure which side of that line I'm on. And I'm not sure if I'm talking to myself, that I should exercise, and I'm just listening to my own echo, or if I'm talking to the person in front of me. But at any rate, I talk about exercise and exercise recommendations a lot. And I have to say, I always feel every single time I have this conversation, and I have this conversation just about every single time I'm in clinic, I have to say, I always add the, the caveat, well, this hasn't been scientifically proven, and that doesn't stop me from then talking you know, at length about this idea, but it hasn't been scientifically proven, and I feel like, okay, let's just talk about it. What is the basis? Is there a basis? Where do we get this idea that we should exercise? And. Uh, so let's, let's take a little survey here. These are common symptoms in PLS and HSP. And I put the word uncomplicated HSP 
And that means HSP that affects the legs only, or legs predominantly, legs and bladder. At any rate, that's uncomplicated. And there are other types of HSP that affect more of the nervous system, and there's an overlap between these types. I'm not getting into that. But these are the common symptoms in HSP and PLS. And it's because these symptoms are so common in both conditions that actually that's why we formed one organization for HSP and PLS, because these, we're dealing with these symptoms. Now, spasticity is obvious. That's muscle tightness. That's a type of muscle tightness. Urinary urgency, weakness in various degrees. Some people are not weak at all. Some people are very weak. Some people are weak in certain muscles, but not in other muscles. Balance impairment, and that, another way to say that is gait ataxia. The word ataxia is often associated with a part of the brain, the cerebellum, but the word ataxia just means in coordination. And so gait ataxia, or balance impairment, is very common in many types of HSP. Uh, neuropathic pain occurs in some people, not, not everybody. Muscle pain, certainly. Orthopedic complications, joints, joints that are bearing weight in a manner they weren't designed for back, hips, ankles, knees, all up the kinetic chain. Um, less focused on is sleep disturbance. Um, many people have restless leg syndrome. I'm not sure if restless leg syndrome, which is very common in the HSP and PLS population, I'm not sure if it's part of the syndrome or just a coexisting but unrelated condition. It's very common. One thing that, to date, we have not addressed from the podium are the psychological consequences. And uh, that is really um, huge and deserves its own airtime at every um, interaction because psychological consequences of dealing with a chronic condition are pervasive. And, and uh, they, on a good day, they're minimal. And on a bad day, they're in the forefront. And they have, different people have different coping strategies and, a, and a, a different degree of intensity. And so I've just listed a few descriptors. Fear, grief, sadness at the loss of ability, guilt about uh, my child um, has inherited this, a condition that I couldn't prevent, um, anxiety, depression, frustration, loneliness, the sense that you're all alone in this, and frustration dealing with a physician or somebody, a provider, who doesn't know as much as you do about this condition that's changed your life. Frustration is a big one. All right. So, and there's other, other symptoms besides these that other forms of HSP can also have. The complicated forms can have other neurologic involvement, but I'm not going to go into that here. So if we look at therapies, and we're not talking about the emerging future that we hope is close about corrective biochemical molecular genetic um, therapies that treat the underlying condition at the present for all of these symptoms, the treatments are only symptomatic. So let's look at them. This is in a nutshell uh, sort of a, an overview of all the treatments for these major symptoms. So, spasticity, I'm not going to go through all these, but spasticity begins with physical therapy, stretching. We have oral baclofen, intrathecal baclofen, um, the pump that was discussed yesterday, dantrium, tizanidine, Botox, tendon lengthening procedures, medical marijuana, uh, investigational approaches, uh, which are experiments. And when you do an investigational approach, you want to be signed, looking at an informed consent document. Um, uh, include spinal cord stimulation, deep brain stimulation, muscle ultrasound. These are approaches to treat spasticity. We just go through this list. Urinary urgency, there's medication, so forth and so on. And then there's also pelvic floor exercise for some types of, of bladder dysfunction. For weakness, the only therapy we know today is physical therapy. In extreme cases, there's been electrical stimulation of muscles for very disabled, particularly disabled children who can't move anything. We try to keep the muscles healthy, but not, that's a separate discussion. 
for uh, most individuals, the only therapy we have for weakness is physical therapy. Balance, which is an important part of gait disturbance, the only therapy we have is physical therapy, and so forth and so on, going through these orthopedic complications. There's medications, there's surgery, there's physical therapy, there's bracing. What about the sleep disturbances? Well, behavioral approaches, medications, so forth, and physical therapy. And you see where I'm going with this. What about the psychological? What about the aerobic deconditioning? And, and I would say, everybody, we're all, uh, unless we're in an Olympic training camp, we're all getting, well, not all of us, some of us are, but uh, most people are becoming deconditioned because we lead us, it's, well, I'm not gonna say everybody, it's very common to lead a sedentary lifestyle and we're cardiovascular deconditioning. That means our endurance capacity, the ability of muscles to use oxygen is reduced. And the only therapies we know for that are physical therapies. And of course, for the psychological consequences are extremely manifold, counseling, behavioral approaches, medication, and physical therapy. So what you see, pretty obvious, each of these common symptoms involves, the, the, the treatment for each of these common symptoms involves physical therapy, but certainly the physical therapy to address spasticity is not the same as the physical therapy to address balance problems. And the physical therapy to address balance problems is not the same as the physical therapy that's going to be used for cardiovascular conditioning. So, it's quite a diverse challenge when we say, well, get some exercise. Yeah, but what are we trying to rehabilitate? Well, we're trying to rehabilitate all of this, different amounts of different people. So, there are many factors that affect walking and standing in PLS and HSP. Weakness, spasticity, balance, the speed of activation. This is really important. By speed of activation, I don't mean how quickly you walk from point A to point B. I mean when the signal goes to move the foot so the toes come up, how quickly does that happen? Does that happen instantly? Or does it happen a microsecond or a millisecond later? If it's delayed, the activation of that movement, it it's, uh, reduces the value of that movement. It, it impairs the function. That's what we mean by speed of activation. It's not the speed of translocating from one point to another. Now, then there's the concept of precision of muscle activation. Okay, so if I want to move my hand, and if I have my hand here, I want to move one finger. What if every time I want to move one finger, my whole hand comes down, my, all my fingers come down? I'm not isolating. What if it happened that I wanted to move one, one finger and both hands comes down? There's overflow. There's lack of precision in isolating. So when I want to move one finger, actually what's happening is I'm inhibiting the movements of the other fingers are being inhibited, actively inhibited, so that I can turn on the movement of one finger. So I'm inhibiting some movements to have a very focused, precise movement. Precise, I mean isolated. And um, a precision or localization or confinement or isolating specific movements is really important in individuals that have upper motor neuron problems, PLS and HSP in particular. Pain is also important. Um, but uh, the relative contribution of each of these factors differs in every person here. So um, some people are very weak, and some people are not weak at all. And some people are very tight, and occasionally I see people, not very, very infrequently, who are not tight at all, even though the term is spastic paraplegia it, with spasticity being part of the defining characteristic, it, sometimes it's minimal spasticity. And not everybody's weak, as I say. And the other part is that the distribution of these symptoms is highly variable. So for example, a person could have extreme weakness in lifting their knees, in hip flexion, and no weakness anyplace else. Or it may be most predominant there. 
Other people might have weakness only in bringing their toes up. Other people might have spasticity mainly in their, in their adductors, bringing their knees together. Other people may have spasticity only in their ankles. So it's not only the severity of each of these factors, it's how they're distributed, and that is gonna be different in every person, and it sometimes changes in that person. So why is this important? It's important because for some people, and this is just a generalization, this is an example. Spas for some people, spasticity, wherever it is, ankles, thighs, hamstrings, quadriceps, it's the major factor limiting walking. And for other people, balance might be the major factor limiting walking, and so and so forth. Each of these different factors contributes to the problem walking, and they're highly variable between individuals, it's highly variable between muscles, and, and uh, if we're gonna address a physical therapy program, we wanna look at the factors in that person that are made, uh, the main contributing factors to the difficulty walking and standing. So, as I say, physical therapy exercises, they're recommended as the primary or adjunctive therapies. The nature of the exercise is very, in each individual, Exercise prescriptions change over time, but still, almost to a person, we recommend exercises, but what's it based on? So, if exercise is so important, and if it's recommended to everybody, or almost everybody, what's the scientific basis of this evidence? And I have three answers for that. First, there's very little direct scientific evidence that physical therapy or exercise benefits anyone with HSP or PLS. There's almost no scientific evidence. So, there it is. Um, but that doesn't stop me. Uh, maybe it should. But there's substantial anecdotal evidence. Anecdotal evidence is someone says, I exercise and it helps. And after I heard that about 100 or 200 times, we actually wrote a protocol to study physical therapy. This is 25 years ago. Wrote a protocol to, to uh, study physical, the impact of physical therapy in people with, with um, HSP. And decided, you know, there's a, 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 a threshold to get a protocol approved by the Institutional Review Board and there's dedicating a person to do the study and time and attention. I decided not to do it because everybody was telling me when I exercise it helps. And I said, well, I'm not gonna spend my resources discovering what seems to be obvious. And I, I kind of wish that I had done that experiment. Um, we went in a different direction. But at any rate, there's substantial anecdotal evidence. People, lots of people say exercise helps. And conversely, when people say, I stopped exercising, I, I fractured my, I had foot surgery, or I had an ankle fracture, or uh, whatever different circumstances. I stopped exercising for a period of months, and then they say my symptoms all got worse. So we, we I hear literally hundreds, I don't, I mean, for, for over the past 30 years, hundreds of people have said, I exercise, it helps. And so then I turn to the next person, and I say, well, you know, this isn't scientifically proven, but people have been telling me exercise helps. So that's what we mean by anecdotal evidence, and it's substantial, and it's not just me in my clinic, it's in other clinics, everybody. Many pe people who see people, care providers who see children and adults with um, HSP or people with primary lateral sclerosis, they have similar experience. However, I am aware that this anecdotal evidence is subject, is, is, um, may have a substantial bias. That is, some people benefit but not everybody benefits. And when they benefit, we pay more attention to those positive responses and we endorse them and they make a more of a mark on the care provider. And we may, be, we may be more persuaded by the emphatic voices of success than by the relative silence of people who say it's not helping. And plus, it gets worse. Because if I say, so are you exercising? And people say, well I know the right answer is yes. And is it helping? Well, they say, well, yes, of course it is. And I'm, 
you know, they, it's, we're sort of, we, it becomes like an echo chamber. We have a, and we don't really know what the truth is anymore. But people, the, this, there is substantial anecdotal evidence. But that doesn't mean it, it's real. But it's, that's really a strong part of what motivates the, the recommendation to exercise. It's not the only part. The second answer is that there are other condi there are sub there is substantial in contrast to the fact that it hasn't been studied in HSP and PLS it has been studied well studied exercise and physical therapy have been well studied to treat these symptoms spasticity and weakness and balance has exercise has been well studied to treat these symptoms when they occur in other conditions so when they occur for example in multiple sclerosis when they occur after a stroke, when they occur in cerebral palsy, when they occur in uh, spinal cord injury, to treat spasticity in spinal cord injury, to treat spasticity in, after a stroke, to treat spasticity in multiple sclerosis, and so forth and so on, physical therapy has been studied well in those, to treat those symptoms, but in other conditions. And there's a lot of peer-reviewed evidence, and the, and the the trend in medicine now is to what we call evidence-based medicine. Everything we recommend, we want to say, what's the scientific basis that recommends that? Okay. That's good. I must have said something wrong. Okay, so, so there's a, there is evidence to treat that physical therapy works on these symptoms when they occur in other disorders. Okay, that's, that's a very important source of the recommendation, and uh, and the in when these therapies have been studied in these other condi to treat these symptoms when they occur in other condition, other conditions, the greatest improvements are in range of motion and functional capacities. Now, functional capacities. I'm using that word functional capacities, and I'll define that in the future, uh, but. The greatest improvements are in range of motion and functional capacities. Now, the third answer is that in terms of rehabilitation of other progressive degenerative neurologic disorders. So, here we're talking about Parkinson's, spinocerebellar ataxia, multiple sclerosis. The recommendations for these therapies reduce preserve the um, functional abilities. And so they're part of a, um, the uh, neurorehabilitation of other degenerative neurologic disorders. And I say degenerative, not all forms of HSP are degenerative. Some we think are developmental. Some are degenerative. Um, some are both developmental and degenerative. But at any rate, the point is, there are three sources of evidence then for recommending exercises, one, anecdotal evidence, which we hear a lot, and I'm aware that it's subject to bias. That doesn't stop me from recommending it. Two, it's by their performance of these therapies to treat these symptoms when they occur in other disorders, and for the general value in the rehabilitation of people that have other chronic degenerative neurologic disease. Now, I did a literature search early this month, and to see how many papers I searched the terms exercise and stroke, and I got 22,000 articles. And then to exercise and spinal cord injury, I got 4,300 articles. And so forth and so on. Exercise and ataxia, 690. Ex exercise and ALS, 408. But you see where I'm going with this. Exercise and HSP, 35 articles. And exercise and PLS, one article. And that article was a case report not a controlled study. So, as I say, there are um, very few, very few articles describing this, in this, specifically for, for these conditions. Now, when they have been described, they have applied a uniform exercise approach. Well, we know that that's not gonna be perfect because no two people are the same and everybody has all these different, very, different degrees of severity and different patterns of involvement and so forth and so on. Um, but the, uh, they, they have, and they've been short-term studies with very few subjects, and but they have shown 
these very few studies, and I'm talking about HSP, have shown improved gait. And I'm saying for the second time, gait improvement, gait is a functional outcome. And that's the second time I've used the word functional, I'll define it. So a specific outcome is when you measure, let's say, the strength of the quadriceps or the strength of hip flexion. Let's say your right hip flexor has a certain power and your left hip flexor has a different power and uh, so forth. So now we're measuring an individual muscle and its individual power. Or if we're grading the hamstrings on the right and we say, well, your right hamstring grades this degree of spasticity and your, uh, and your uh, quadriceps has a different degree of spasticity. These are specific measures. We can also look at the timing, for example, this is the more sophisticated, like when, when you're walking and, uh, and you're lifting your knee, your hip flexion, and at that exact millisecond, your toes come up. And so we could look at the, the timing of when does your hip come up compared to when does your toes come up on that side, and is it delayed at the toes? We can measure, make all these kind of measurements. These are specific measurements, but now I want to talk about complex functional measurements because these are the areas where exercise has shown the most benefit. And that is, for example, speed of walking. You say, well, walking speed, why is that a complex measurement? Well, because, you know, you have to lift your knee, bend your foot back, move your trunk, swing your arms. Are you in pain? Are you using your trunk to compensate for lifting? Your whole body is involved in that task. So it's a function that involves multiple movements, multiple muscles. It's a, a gesture. It's a coordinated action. It's a sequence of coordinated actions at many joints. It's very complex. It's a functional process. Let's consider a functional process of um, the ability to walk, stop on command, not take an extra step, bend over, pick up an object, stand up, turn around, walk back. That's highly complex, but this is a real world action. And, and these, are, these are complex outcomes. These are complex functional tests as opposed to isolated um, specific tests. And there's one I want to mention in particular, and that's this dual task walking. We all do dual task walking or triple task walking all the time. And that is when, when so for example, if you, if, you, if you study somebody walking on a, in fact, this was done here at SPF conference a few years ago, had a, a gate mat to study people's walking. And uh, you watch people walk and you watch where their stride length is and how far apart the feet are, the stance and the speed of walking and when the foot hits, it's the ground, is it hit more towards the heel or more towards the toe? Measure all these parameters. And then you ask a person to, to walk while they're counting backwards from 100 by 7. <laughs> and all their walking falls apart. Not all of it, some of these parameters are affected more than others. But, and so, Walking in a grocery store where you're looking at all, walking while window shopping, walking while you're on your cell phone is a lot different than just walking when you're not distracted. And so that's what we call dual task walking. And dual task walking is real world walking and walking in the doctor's office 25 feet in a hallway, that's not real world walking. And so, and, that, and dual task walking is a complex functional outcome. Now, um, why am I I'm mentioning dual task walking here for a reason? And I'll get back to that. But these are, a, these are representative literature in the HSP evidence bank for, for uh, improvement, or for, the, for the impact of exercise. And as I say, it's sparse. And some of these articles are only protocols. One of these articles, two of these articles, or three of these articles are case reports. So, but I do want to point out a couple articles here. One is that uh, COVID era, and this is an article described, uh, the, the data was by subjective response. Individuals reported their symptoms. And they said, uh, during the COVID era, when I was not walking and not socializing and staying home, all of my symptoms increased. 
my strength went down, my endurance went down, my tightness went up, my balance was affected. And these are in people with hereditary spastic paraplegia. Now, there's other articles in the same series that addressed the same increase in neurologic symptoms in other individuals, not HSP, in the COVID era. So that kind of would add in my mind to we take away exercise, symptoms increase. So that's one thing I want to mention. The second is this concept of robot-assisted gait training. And I'll show you an example of that. And that's what I'm thinking about when I talk, one of the things I'm thinking about when I say emerging rehabilitation strategies. It's not emerging today, it's been around for years, but not everybody's participating in it. The other concept is an article that's pretty good, and, and I take a, is the, well done, is the effective hydrotherapy, that's a, aquatic exercise in HSP. So I'll, I'll talk about, about these robot-assisted and the hydrotherapy. This is a robot-assisted, this is an example. This device is called a locomat. And it's a, it's a robot-assisted. And, and there's different forms of this. I've known a number of patients who've tried this. And this is robot-assisted gait training. And uh, this is an article where they've done it in hereditary spastic paraplegia in an individual with HSP, but it's also been done in individuals with all kinds of other neurologic conditions. And the principle is this. This person is in a harness, and they're lifted up. So they're actually not bearing weight on their feet. And you can dial in how much weight they're bearing. It could be no weight, so they're just sort of floating, barely making contact with the bottom. Or it could be that, um, that uh, they have 10% uh, of their weight on their feet and 90% uh, and support, or it could be 70%. It, it could, you, can, you can decide how much weight the person is bearing on their legs. Next. Uh, there, it's a treadmill, and uh, the treadmill goes fast or slow or has an incline. And the other part is that the legs are surrounded by these kind of brace enclosures that are connected to a mechanical activator. And in this setup, the uh, mechanical activator times so that the legs are moved. So you can imagine in, in the one extreme, the person is lifted up, they're barely touching the surface, maybe 5% maybe of their weight, 10% of the weight is touching the surface, or maybe none, and then the device moves their legs, and they, they, they look like they're walking, but it's entirely passive. It's an emulation of walking that their body is being put through paces that they're not initiating. Okay? Now, you can have different degrees of this, but by robotic-assisted, in the extreme, um, so, for example, a person with a, with a severe spinal cord injury where they have very little strength, maybe they have a little bit of residual function, their legs are being moved for them. And there's different degrees of this, different speeds, it can go uphill, and so on. And the, the uh, finding is that with this relatively passive emulation of movement. The body is being put through a walking procedure, but the person's not initiating it. Walking is better after that. So, and it doesn't last. It's, it, uh, they say, one person I know says, if he has it on a Wednesday, he's good till Friday. And then he wants to go back on a Monday or a Tuesday. It lasts a couple days. Um, but, so it doesn't last, but it helps. He says, for, I'm thinking about one person in particular, and this is anecdotal evidence, so we have to be, it's subject to bias. But I know a number of people have this, and there, and there are a couple of reports, so not many. And he says when he walks, when he goes into the facility where they have this, you know, he's using two canes with forearm, two forearm crutches, very difficult, and he, has, he says it's a significant, significantly easier for him to go out to his car afterwards. So... Um, I've heard it, I've read it, but it's not a lot of published evidence, but this is an emerging concept, and the concept is passive movement. We'll get back to that. Now, there is a long history of uh, hippotherapy. Um, hippotherapy is therapeutic horseback riding. This goes back hundreds of years, and many years for individuals with cerebral, decades for individuals with cerebral palsy. 
have used uh, hippotherapy, therapeutic horseback riding. And of course, it doesn't help everybody. Nothing we're talking about is, one size doesn't fit all, but it occurs to me that there might be some similarity, this is just uh, my speculation, that there might be some similarities between therapeutic horseback riding and overlap between therapeutic horseback riding and uh, robotic assisted uh, gait training. And that is when you're on the horse, besides working on your core muscles and your thigh muscles to stay up and so on, all that, besides that, when the horse moves, the body moves in a, in a very parallel manner. The horse moves, the arms swing, the legs move in opposite the swing of the arms. So on a horse, there is passive movement of the arms and legs to emulate what the horse is doing. And I'm just wondering, this is my own speculation, this is, we don't know this, but I'm wondering if the passive movement on a horse is providing some of the same, I'm wondering this, this is not proven, I'm sharing a speculation that the passive movements are valuable in both of these um, applications. I do want to say, if we mentioned therapeutic horseback riding, that many years ago, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, um, at, a, at a conference, and actually I don't even know if, it was an, if, the, if the foundation was in existence then, I'm not sure. Yeah, St. Louis, yeah, it was. But uh, um, Rebecca Hart has HSP, and she was a Paralympic um, athlete on equestrian, and she came and talked to the HSP, to the SPF uh, organization, and her uh, and they've been active in SPF uh, for years, and so uh, that's just an, I can't mention hippotherapy without mentioning we have a star in our community who's a is an equestrian um, athlete. Now, what about hydrotherapy? This is really interesting to me. So this is aquatic exercise, and what this they did they took people with HSP, and they were in a for a period of time, several weeks, I think. They measured their walking, walking speed. And, but beyond that, they had a gait lab. And in the gait lab, it was very detailed. So they had uh, sensors they put on the joints and on the, on the limbs. And then they had video. And so they can take away the body, and they're only looking at the position sensors. And they can make calculations about the speed of which these joints are moving and the timing of one joint movement versus another. These are um, very detailed analysis in a, in a sophisticated gait lab. So they measured functional outcomes, walking speed and things like that, stride length. And then they measured the mechanics of walking. And um, they found that after some period of time, a couple weeks, in, in, uh, several weeks in uh, aqua therapy, that there was improvement in gait speed. They said 10%. Well, 10% is pretty good for a fairly short-term involvement. But then they looked at the mechanics of, of the, in the gate lab, and, and they said, well, they, they're walking faster, and people say they're walking better. And they analyzed how they were walking, and they weren't walking more normally. They were walking differently abnormally. They, they started out with a problem walking, they walked better, they walked faster, they felt better, more confident in their walking, but their walking wasn't becoming normal. Their walking, uh, so what it says is that what was happening was that we they were training compensatory mechanisms to facilitate the functional gait improvement. They weren't making their walking more normal, but their walking was better and easier for them in that, for that short period of time. That's really important. So what do we care, you know? I mean, if, it, if walking is easier and, and, uh, and, and, and faster, does it have to be more normal? Well, we want both. We want, our, we, want our, we want both. We want to be easier. We also want to be more normal. Why? Because we want to keep the joints healthy. We want our ankles to bear weight the way they were designed and knees and so forth. So we, we want it, we're happy with the functional outcome, yes. But we want to also have it be we want to get it to be more mechanically normal, if we can. So this is a very interesting outcome. Now, uh, I'm just going to go through this. So e exercise in ataxia, spinal cerebellar ataxia. I picked ataxia because there's a lot of exercise studies in ataxia. And, there are n and, and ataxia 
in coordination is an important feature for many, but not all, many, but not all individuals um, who have SPG7. SPG7 is one of the most common forms of HSP. And many people with, H with SPG7, many, not all, um, and it doesn't mean if I'm talking about ataxia that someone's going to develop it. I'm not having any implications like that. I'm just saying that ataxia is a common feature in SPG7, and exercise has been studied in ataxia. And so uh, it's been well studied in ataxia, and here's a home balance therapy program. After six weeks, it improved ataxia. This is a home study, not, a, not in a gate lab or a uh, other facility. Now, um, this study I, I pulled out, I, I mean, there are hundreds of studies in, a, in ataxia, but I brought this out because this is a video game study. And so there's a walking, there's all kinds of ways, all kinds of physical therapy approaches to, um, to reduce ataxia. Balance, we're talking about, improving balance. And one of those approaches is a video game strategy where like a we Fit video game, so and, and we'll talk about that more, but this is using a we fit approach to reduce ataxia. And uh, here's another a separate study looking at uh, exercise games, we fit type video games. In fact, people have gone further than this to use virtual reality, That's, but I don't want to get into that, but they say that um, it has a value in reducing ataxia in other words, reducing ataxia means improving balance. So here's another one. We talked about regular exercises or balance type exercises, video game exercises. Here's cycling improve, reduces or improves balance. Now, besides treating the specific symptoms of uh, spasticity or strength or weakness, whatever, exercise has a value in, neuroplast in promoting, facilitating neuroplasticity. What is neuroplasticity? Well, when we leave here today, we'll turn off the lights and come in tomorrow, we'll turn the lights on, and all the circuits in this room have been, exact. we hope, exactly the same, unchanged, day after day. Now, in the nervous system, for the majority, it is similar, there's connections from one part of the brain to the other parts of the brain, and there are millions of these connections into the spinal cord, and in general, they are very stable. However, the uh, nervous system re re retains within itself the ability to change these connections. And, it, and the change in these connections could be to facilitate, that is, I, at a structural level. So nerves can grow out um, sprouting that can uh, make more connections with other cells that they didn't used to make connections with, or they can increase the connections with one, one nerve is making contact with uh, 10 other nerves, and it can now, and it can do it with a, just a few little synapses or with, with a, triple that number of synapses, so that's really enriched. This is a structural growth of, of the nerve endings. It can also um, facilitate that connection by, at a molecular level, so that when the when the uh, impulse comes down a nerve to stimulate the next nerve, that next nerve is instantly stimulated at a very quick, at a molecular level. It could be a structural level with the nerves growing. It could be at a molecular level. It can also be to prune back connections. If this connection is not being used or there's a, um, then, then the, the nerve can, the nerve endings can regress, can grow out in a different direction it can be down-regulated of those molecular processes to respond to that nerve. So, by neuroplasticity, we mean the changing potential to make new connections, to prune existing connections, um, and to facilitate those connections. And the only thing we know that drives that is exercise. Exercise facilitates nerve connections within uh, that, that the, the neuroplastic potential is facilitated by exercise. Now, I'm not talking about exercise here to reduce spasticity. That's its own thing. Or exercise to reduce balance problems. That's its own thing. I'm talking about neuroplasticity to drive, I'm sorry, exercise to drive neuroplasticity for the brain and the spinal cord 
to remodel itself. And the only thing we know that, that um, facilitates neuroplasticity, I mean, there are experimental paradigms, um, that, but, but in, uh, the, the strongest evidence is from, from uh, exercise. And, uh, um, and so, for example, if you, did a, if you did a functional MRI scan and you looked at the bowing hand of a concert violinist and you looked at the part of the brain that controls the bowing hand of a concert violinist, you'd find that, or if you looked at the part of the brain that controls the ankles of a, an Olympic uh, figure skater, and these studies have been done, um, there's overdevelopment of that part of the brain that controls the bowing hand um, in a concert violinist, and we think that's from just hours and hours and hours and years of very precise, constant training, the brain has changed. And uh, so, uh, and we can see that on imaging. And you, one could argue, this is off the subject perhaps, but maybe it's on the subject, that the reason they became a concert violinist was because they could facilitate their brain developing in that way that would permit them to develop that facility. Or the reason they became a figure skater, because some people would do the same activity for um, decades but never get that same degree of skill was because maybe they weren't training, the, 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 there could be the, the, the training of the brain could, could be the outcome of the, of the exercise, but we may, um, some people may be gifted in their in the degree to which they can augment their ability based on their training. So it's interesting. At any rate, here's a study that says exercise, and they're looking at functional brain network connectivity in older adults without dementia. Well, there's, none of us have dementia. Uh, what were you talking about? <laughs> uh, so exercise um, to, to was shown to increase functional brain connectivity um, a recent study, and uh, so that's important because we're talking about rehabilitation from a chronic neurologic disease. We need to have compensatory neural mechanisms. Now, so here's that word dance. Dance was also studied recently, and, uh, and here they looked at a, a systematic review of clinical trials to look at whether dance therapy um, as a type of physical therapy, promotes neuroplasticity, and they found uh, that it did, that dance therapy promoted neuroplasticity. Okay. Now, so, therapeutic dance. And we're talking about dance, and I'm the one talking about it. <laughs> and if there's a dance therapist here, then they can take over this part. But in lieu of that, I'll just carry on. Uh, the neuroscience of dance is emerging. Dance has been used for therapy for hundreds of years, for therapy. But st dance studied as it for its neuro for its, uh, the neurologic consequences of dance is only more recently being studied, and uh, it shows a promise for um, improving the outcome of of. Uh, motor performance in neurologic patients with diverse neurologic disorders. And uh, uh, I have this one observation here, and this was from uh, uh, Alexandra Durr and uh, Dr. Vincent and their leading uh, scientists, clinicians, in uh, Paris. In fact, uh, that's where the uh, spastin gene was identified. And, the, and Dr. Durr, in particular, sees hundreds of people with HSP. And I was at a conference in France, and they talked about dance. And they gave a little demonstration of what they mean by dance. And they have a, a newsletter called SPATAX, for spastic ataxia. And uh, it's the equivalent of the SPF's synapse um, uh, newsletter. And they, re they observe that therapeutic dance improves motor performance in HSP. Now, that's an observation. It's, it's not a uh, peer-reviewed study. Dance has been studied in multiple sclerosis. And here they're talking about 
targeted ballet programs. Dance has been studied in cerebral palsy. Now, what are some of the theoretical uh, reasons to think about dance? Well, as I say, the gait impairment in HSP and in PLS is not simply a motor problem, a muscle problem, or a spasticity of the muscle problem, or a muscle weakness problem. We know that there's often a balance component, and we know that there's sometimes a position sense part of this. So it, it's not just a motor problem, even though the motor symptoms predominate. It's not only motor problem. We know that balance is affected. And uh, balance can be affected by motor problems or by sensory problems, but in many people with HSP and some people with PLS, actually there is a sensory component, which is, we'll talk about it separately. At any rate, um, so besides the motor problems in HSP, motor I mean spasticity and weakness, there's also problems in premotor planning. And here I'm referring back to this concept that when the person is, by premotor planning, if I'm going to move my hand from here to here, well, I, my hand is here, my eyes see this, my brain computes the distance, my brain decides how, f how much power I should give my hand so it doesn't go halfway or past it. My brain has already planned this process in the premotor parts of the brain, has already planned that, where it's going to start, where it's going to stop, and then, my, then it, that information goes to the motor parts of the brain, and then the motor parts of the brain execute that activity. But that activity has already been decided and planned and organized based on all kinds of, 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 of data, visual data in this example. And it could be memory, but at any rate. So there's the pre, why, do I think, why do we think that premotor parts of the brain or other parts of the brain are affected? It's because when we distract the person, they're walking, becomes much worse. When their brain is occupied by thinking about something, their walking falls apart. And, and it, it could be that walking is so difficult that other parts of the brain, premotor planning, are really called into play to augment walking. But um, we know that whether, it's, whether the premotor planning is affected or whether premotor planning is is um, overused in, to compensate, premotor planning is an important part of gait um, disturbance in um, HSP and PLS. And premotor planning is not the same as muscle power and muscle spasticity. It's in the brain's coordination. And it uses, premotor planning uses all kinds of senses and memory and coordination and so forth. At any rate, the other part is that there's the precision of motor activity. So when we want to move the leg, we have to silence the other leg. We want to move one leg. We want to inhibit the contralateral leg. We need to isolate this. And, and uh, if we have difficulty doing that, then our, we're having more gross body movements. Or uh, it could be we need to isolate the right leg from the left leg. And within the right leg, we need to isolate the quadriceps movement from the hamstrings movement. We need to silence these other movements, relatively silent, not totally zero them out, but inhibit their activity to get, to get um, um, the isolated movements we want. So gait impairment is not only a motor problem. There's balance. There's premotor involvement. There's uh, suppressing to, uh, other movements to, uh, in a contralateral limb which means one hemisphere is connecting to another hemisphere and silencing the limb at the brain level. And, uh, and we know that that problem is often impaired in, in children with cerebral palsy, um, or there are some studies. At any rate, so my point is, if we're going to address walking, we have to address the whole issue of walking. That is, the complex kinesthetic. Kinesthetic is motor and sensory motor programming and therapeutic dance um, facilitates this complex motor programming. It's not, just must, it's not just one movement specific. It's a gesture. 
And gestures, if I, a gesture is like this. It's a continuous movement. It's not lift, move, up, over. These are segmental movements. But a gesture is a, is a, is a continuous flow. It's a very, uh, it's a sequence of movements that, that where, the, where the one movement transitions into another without interruption, and they're complex movements without interruption. These are what we talk about gestures, and they're simple gestures, you know, and there's complex gestures. And we want to work on this concept of achieving, and walking is, is uh, has a lot of gestural components in it. And, uh, and so, if we talk about dance, what do we mean by dance? What do I mean by dance? I mean, what are the elements of dance? Well, essential in dance is timing, rhythm, and um, so what I do, what, what we do, and what I've seen a dance therapist do, um, you start with a, uh, well, I'll talk about the, how to address these in a minute. Other elements besides timing is auditory cueing. Now, people that are deaf can dance, so it, it doesn't mean that you have to hear, but um, auditory cueing facilitates dance. And again, we're using more of the brain to inform the, the other parts of the brain, the premotor areas, to make gestures of what we're trying to accomplish. So auditory cueing, visual cueing, people who are blind can dance. So visual cueing is not essential, but it facilitates the process. And as I say, we're trying to make gestures. These are continuous, uh, complex movements without a beginning, without an end. Now, so some, some concepts to think about. Uh, what do I mean by timing? How do we facilitate this? Well, um, I'm not gonna bring it up here, but I have an app on my phone, a metronome, and it gives an audible sound, a tick, tock, tick, tock. I can set it whatever speed I want. And so you start out, you might uh, just, well, I can't show you here maybe, but just uh, at the, you set it at a very slow speed, and when, it, when the beat comes, and you have to force yourself to be on that beat, this is essential. It's not when you want to move your foot, it's when the beat comes. You have to move your foot at that time. Just one step, but it has to be exactly to the best of your ability when the beat comes. And now you're using a lot of your brain to program your movement. And you say, that's too fast, so slow it down. It doesn't matter how slow it goes. It's, you have to start at a place of success. And so you, when you start very slow, and we're going just like one foot over the side. One, and then when the next beat, back. Next beat, out. That's to a beat. And now the next, another way to do it would be the other leg. And after doing this for a period of time, when, then you can increase the speed. And then you can make it more complicated because you could go out, back, out, back, alternate legs. And then you could go forward. And then you could go back. So now we're still sticking on the beat. On the beat is very important because you're, you're, and you're using, you're, you're driving the movement not by volition, by, in, by desire or by decision, but you're trying to pair it to your brain's timing and anticipation of the beat is telling you when to move your foot. Now, then it gets, it gets um, you start with a very simple and it gets more complex. Now, there's auditory cueing. And again, we're trying to include more of the brain to drive these actions. Visual cueing includes like watching other people online, doing with a partner. The exercise games, this is an example of visual cueing where you're emulating somebody you're watching them move and you're trying to do what they do within your ability. And if it's too complicated, it won't be valuable. And then we want to focus on gestures. And gestures are, right now I just made simple movements, but we want to build up from there to gestures. And we want to find the degree of movement and speed where the gesture is possible. Okay, I'm going over this very quickly. But dance can be performed seated or standing supported or unsupported, on land or in water. 
So we all can do this. These are, these are timed rhythm gestures. Start simple and increase slowly. You start simple with one movement, two movements, then reciprocal movements, then forward movements, then incorporate your trunk and incorporate your arms and incorporate bending and get as complicated as you want. Start within your ability. Recognize that training muscle um, power and speed occurs at about the 70 to 80 percent of maximum ability. So it should be challenging but it should be doable. In other words, it's, if you want to start at 60% of your ability, or, the, the, or some, it, find out what you can do, go to the upper limit of what you can do, and that's where training occurs. When you're at the limit of what you can do and you're failing a lot, let's say that's at 100%, or at the 90%, there's very little training, neuro training and muscle training, uh, when you're at that level of exertion. And, and uh, so find, find where you, what you can do, stay at the 70 to 80% and gradually increase. Another mantra of mine is that frequency is more important than intensity. That is, uh, small sessions, two minutes, five minutes, three times a day, once a day. Building up is more important than Tuesday is my one hour period. Small periods of time throughout the day because the benefits wear off. And plus, we're training the nervous system. We're training the neuroplasticity. We're working on balance and so forth. Consider why, uh, the, the We Fit exercise and somehow find joy in this. Find that it's fun. Make it fun. If it's not fun, it's going to be, if it's a, it's, a, if it's a burden and our lives are already too burdened, it's going to be off the radar. But, um, so find joy, meaning, chart your progress, and expect improvements. And this is based on people that, again, anecdotal evidence, but people that have done this and said it helps their balance, it helps their walking, it helps their posture. So that's uh, conclusions. Exercise and physical therapy recommendations are not based on the scientific data from this community. It's based on other conditions. A lot of it's anecdotal. A lot of it's subject to uh, bias. But people that have exercised say it helps. And I endorse that. But the other part is some people may benefit and other people may not. And, and if you're not benefiting, we need to figure out then we're doing something wrong. If exercise is not helping, we need to change the exercise. And as I say, it has to be highly individualized for that person, for those muscles, for those symptoms at that point in their life. So, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fink. We're not going to take any questions right now. We're going to set for our next panel. Remember, Dr. Fink is on tomorrow morning. Remember, from 8 to 10, 15 tomorrow morning. So I'll ask a bunch of questions then. Okay, you guys did real good. Give us a couple of minutes here. We're going to flip this over and get ready for our next presentation. Thanks, everybody.